want to get paid to rob banks? I am not kidding. That's a real job. Today, we are talking about ethical hacking and penetration testing. And as you're about to see, it is probably one of the coolest jobs in the world. But be honest, what do you think when you hear the word hacker? It's moving too fast. Oh, this is not good. I'll create a GUI interface using Visual Basic. See if I can track an IP address. System breach. Oh. Firewall one. We got a problem. What? Someone synced a rat to one of my servers. Uh, remote access tool. We're being hacked. But we've been so careful. How could they find us? They haven't found us yet. Just cracked the outer layer of our system. I'll start an intrusion inspection and find out who our rat is. Uh oh. What? They're onto us. Vikram's trying to track our IP address. Oh, can you stop it? No. But I can slow him down. Something like that, probably, right? A lot of people like to use that word, and very few of them understand its origin or what it actually means. And today, we're going to talk about that. But we're also going to talk about a very specific kind of hacking. That's right. Today, we are going to clear up what people actually mean when they use the term ethical hacking. Did you know the original meaning of the word hacker actually had nothing to do with computers? That's right, hacker was coined in 1960 to describe the process the MIT Tech Model Railroad Club took when modifying their train sets to functions they weren't originally intended to have. That actually makes more sense, right? We say things like life hacks because hacking isn't just something you can do with a computer. It's an approach to anything. It just means where other people see rules, you see possibilities. And while the term hacking wasn't originally applied to computers, it's pretty safe to say that's what most people mean when they say it today. Hacking usually means gaining access to data that's supposed to be protected, forcing machines that you don't own to misbehave, etc. As technology became more advanced, so too did the people hacking it. Every new platform is a new opportunity. There are people who develop technologies, whether it's hardware like phones or computers, software like programs or apps, or things like communication protocols. Those people, if they're good at what they do, try to predict all of the ways their technology could be misused and protect against them. The reason they do this is that there is another group of people who make Make it their mission to uncover and either exploit or report vulnerabilities in those technologies. And these people are what we would call hackers. And this thought process gives us an explanation of the three kinds of hackers. The first is black hat hackers. These are people who hack not to find and report vulnerabilities, but to exploit them for personal gain. These people are usually unsanctioned, they can run in crews or they can be independent, and they essentially hack for their own personal motives, whatever those may be. These are the guys who write the malware that the white hats have to protect against. But keep in mind, these categories don't imply skill level, just motivation. A beginner spreading malware they found without really knowing what it can do is still a black hat if their intention is to cause harm. Some hacker crews are after money, some are after data they can sell on the dark web, some are in it frankly just like for the thrill, the sense of power you get from cracking something that no one wanted you to crack. Then you have gray hats. They are the purple lightsaber of hackers. They don't necessarily hack for evil, if you will, but they don't have permission to be breaking into the systems they touch either. When they discover a vulnerability, they might report it to the creator, sometimes requesting like a fee to fix it, but if the owner doesn't respond or doesn't comply, they might publish the vulnerability to the rest of the world. And finally, we have white hat hackers. These guys are hired by companies to attempt to break in or find security vulnerabilities with the company's permission. White hats use the same techniques as black hats, the only difference is they do it with the owner's consent. This also means they hack within the law. I've heard people say they use their powers for good. This is what's called ethical hacking. When you get hired as an ethical hacker, your job is to scour your client for vulnerabilities and often to run what's known as a pen test or penetration test. This is where you meet with a client to outline certain objectives in a contract that you would need to meet for them to feel like the vulnerabilities you've uncovered were sufficiently damaging as to warrant basically them spending the money to fix it. Basically, you need to prove somebody could hurt them so bad by the pathway that you found to get into their system that they need to spend the money to get it fixed. These objectives might be like, prove to us you can get into the vault or like install a root kit somewhere. You also outline what methods you are and are not allowed to use. No holds barred means you can literally use anything. This would be the most similar to what your client would be facing in the real world. But that also would mean you could like drive a bulldozer into the front of the building and like scoop up the ATM and carry it away if you wanted to. So usually 
that is against the rules. <laughs> usually, usually stuff like physical damage is against the rules, but it'll be like no physical damage, but you can pick locks. It's like that kind of thing. Oh yes, and that's the other thing. Teams of hackers probably aren't all programmers. The heist movie cliche is a cliche, but it's semi-accurate in that you'll do best if you have a lot of different kinds of experts. You'll want human hackers, aka social engineers, for a physical pen test for sure. They can manipulate their way into a building and install malware that was written by your team's programmer. See, we all work together, look at that. So yeah, not all hackers are like sitting at a laptop. Actually, Retired servicemen and actors make great pen testers, so if that sounds like you, this could be something that you might be interested in looking into. Anyway, this leads us to our final definition of terms you've probably heard, red team versus blue team. The blue team represents the in-house security team that a company has hired to keep them safe, and the red team represents the team of ethical hackers they've hired to try and break in. It's like offense and defense, basically. And this right here is why educating people on hacking and cybersecurity is so important to me. People actually like to come at me for like teaching people how to hack. Girl, how are you gonna know how to defend yourself if you don't know what you're trying to defend yourself against? As Ymir Vigfusson said in his TED talk on learning to hack, I want you to become a hacker because I think not understanding hacking creates a paralyzing fear of cybersecurity. And you cannot understand defense if you do not understand offense. I feel like I do this every episode, but I am again going to shout out the fantastic podcast series, Dark Dent Diaries. It is one of the best resources to hear stories about hacking, both ethical and black hat, and it gives you a really great sense of what goes into both. Also, y'all know by now, but this video was made in partnership with Grizzly Information Security Solutions. And if you came from TikTok or the Discord server, this special hello is for you. I love y'all. Stay safe. You stayed for the cutscene! Hello. Bro, I just got done watching Star Wars in the Machete Order for the first time, which is four, five, one, two, three, six. And people will tell you that you skip one, but I never skip one because Qui-Gon Jinn is my father. I would only watch one sometimes. Part of the Machete Order now is that if you want to, you can watch the new trilogy. I told myself that I wasn't going to because as we all know, the new trilogy is disgraceful. Um, But then I did for some reason, don't know why. Yeah, it sucks, it's so bad. And it's even worse coming off of like all of this Star Wars recent knowledge that I now have, having just watched the other ones, you know? How could they do that? How could they do that? So what I decided is that the new trilogy is really just like really expensive, sanctioned fan fiction. That's what I've decided because you know, the creators are all fans of the show. So it's really basically just fan fiction. And then I remembered like, oh wait, <laughs> it's not like, this is history. Like, these are just characters who are owned by everyone who, like, tells the story, you know? If I want to decide that the events never happened, I can make that choice, <laughs> and that can be my truth, and nobody can stop me. Except for George Lucas. If George Lucas told me that I was wrong, I would listen to him. I, I respect George Lucas's word only. Anyway, if you're watching this, I want to know that you watched this. Comment your favorite Star Wars movie down below, or if you've never seen Star Wars, um then watch Star Wars. <laughs> but you can also comment that you've never seen Star Wars and I will. We should like all watch it together on like Discord or something. Is that even possible? Copyright? I don't know. If it's illegal, I didn't say that. I'm so scared that I'm gonna get lit on fire. All this hair, man. It's very flammable. <laughs> Thanks for staying.